Hi, I'm Shannon, the podcast producer here at C-SPAN. This week on the Lectures in History podcast, a discussion on the legacy of Mamie Till Mobley. University of Kentucky professor Brandon Irby discusses Till Mobley's efforts to bring awareness to her son Emmett Till's murder in 1955. Class starts right after this. Hi, I'm Tammy, and joining me today is Paul, as we celebrate 45 years of C-SPAN's unblinking eye on the democratic process. That's right, Tammy. Since our founding in 1979, C-SPAN has been documenting history with a unique approach, unfiltered, without commentary, and entirely independent from government funding. C-SPAN is funded by fees from our cable and satellite distribution partners, and now with fewer people subscribing to cable and satellite, we're asking you to help support our next 45 years. It's amazing to see how C-SPAN has adapted and grown. With the rise of digital platforms and social media, C-SPAN has expanded its reach. So no matter where you are, you have 24-7, 365 access to the democratic process. And as we navigate this ever-changing media environment, C-SPAN's dedication to putting you in the rooms where politics is debated and policy is determined will not waver. We ask you to support C-SPAN's vital mission. As we celebrate 45 years of service, your contribution helps us to continue to adapt and grow in this digital age. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your contribution today. Here's to 45 more years of bringing democracy directly to you wherever you get your news. Thank you for your support. Visit cspan.org slash donate today to make a difference. I just want to say thank you uh, for coming on this very rainy and dreary and cold day. Uh, last Wednesday of Black History Month, so we're going to celebrate with this topic today. But it's such an honor to really bring this story uh, to you. I think this is a remarkable woman, and I am so honored to feature her work today. So I want to start by thinking about the ways that we are currently living in this age of, of remembering Mamie Till Mobley. <clears throat> In the last two years, we have observed the ABC limited series Women of the Movement dramatize the lives and stories of Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley and make them accessible on television screens, mobile devices, and the streaming platform Hulu. Unfolding across six episodes over three weeks, Women of the Movement centers Till Mobley's activist efforts in the wake of her son's brutal murder and brilliantly portrays the heroic deeds of the individuals, communities, and organizations supporting her desire to bring awareness to Till's death and hold accountable those responsible for it. <clears throat> After Women of the Movement aired each week, the three-part docuseries Let the World See immediately followed, providing audiences with another resource to discover more about Mamie Till Mobley's life and how her decision to leave her son's casket open emboldened others to invoke the memory of Till in their fight for racial justice during both the eras of Jim Crow and the Black Lives Matter movement. Five months after the premieres of Women of the Movement and Let the World See, ABC News amplified Till Mobley's experiences in the podcast reclaimed the story of Mamie Till Mobley. On October 14th, 2022, the film Till debuted in select theaters across the U.S. and became the first production about the Till case to be distributed on the big screen. As stated on the film's website, Till unveils the true story of Mamie Till Mobley's relentless pursuit of justice and underscores the universal power of a mother's ability to change the world. As you can see in this left corner there, President Biden also screened the film Till at the White House in February of last year. And he remarked, this film powerfully tells the story of a mother's loss and a young son's promise, a nation's reckoning about hate, violence, and power. A few months later, on what would have been Emmett Till's 82nd birthday, President Biden signed a proclamation to create the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley National Monument. The traveling exhibit Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley Let the World See opened in the fall of 2022 at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. And a beautiful statue, as you can see in the right, of Mamie Till Mobley speaking behind a podium 
was unveiled on April 29th, 2023, outside of Argo Community High School in Illinois, which is Till Mobley's alma mater. While these projects and occasions are powerfully uh, presented to us as productions that richly contribute to Till Mobley's legacy, they are not the only ones in which Till Mobley's name and work has been invoked in recent memory. Although these occasions present holistic narratives that commemorate Till Mobley and her son, some cases, unfortunately, denote the racial animosity and violence that exist in our society. For example, when a Los Angeles home owned by NBA superstar LeBron James was vandalized with a racial slur in May of 2017, James responded during a press conference by saying that racism and hate, especially for black Americans, are alive every day. He also stated that one of the first things he thought of about learning after learning about the vandalism of his property was Mamie Till Mobley. In his words, the reason that she had an open casket is because she wanted to show the world what her son went through as far as a hate crime and being black in America is concerned. James's comments connected Till Mobley's stance with a responsibility for telling the truth about the work of achieving racial equality in the United States. Till Mobley's name circulated in the sports world once again in 2022, on the first day of Black History Month, when Brian Flores, a former black NFL head coach, filed a class action complaint against the NFL and the New York Giants, Miami Dolphins, and Denver Broncos franchises due to their lack of hiring and retaining black head coaches, coordinators, and general managers. In the complaint's preliminary statement, civil rights icons such as Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and Mamie Till Mobley were listed to honor the brave leaders that fought so hard to help break down racial barriers of injustice. And I want to point out this left photo here. In the fall of 2022, UK student Kyla Spring was verbally and physically attacked on campus by another student, repeatedly calling her a racial slur. So here locally at the University of Kentucky, the courage that Till Mobley displayed decades ago continues to encourage students today to speak out against racism. The encounter with Miss Spring was recorded, and after she posted it to her social media accounts, the online video quickly went viral. After days of campus protests and outrage, Miss Spring posted an image of Mamie Till Mobley on her Instagram page and wrote that Till Mobley is someone that she deeply admires. In documenting an act of racism and circulating it for all to see, Kyla Spring operated in the tradition of Till Mobley and other black women who have become leaders of racial justice initiatives. And another recent example of Till Mobley's memory being spotlighted in a glaring way occurred also in 2022, in the aftermath of an incomprehensible act of brutal violence, the mass shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. On social media and in the mainstream press, Till Mobley's decision to let the people see what happened to Emmett Till was offered as the latest model for how to reckon with and suppress gun violence in the United States. In a June 2022 Los Angeles Times article entitled, After Uvalde Shooting, People Consider an Emmett Till Moment to Change Gun Debate, the viewing of Emmett Till's corpse is described as an event that infuriated and motivated people to create social change. As stated in the article, some people believe an Emmett Till moment could change the course of the country's gun control debate by illustrating the bloody and deadly impact of firearms. The idea of communities and lawmakers seeing gruesome photos or videos of the dead children has raised questions about whether it might bolster long awaited traction on gun control measures at the state and federal levels. In the op-ed, Photos of Slain Children Might Jolt the U.S. Into Reality, published in May 2022 in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, a woman named Evie writes, as outrageous and sickening as it may seem, perhaps if we saw photos of those torn and mangled Uvalde children with their faces protected, then reality would jolt those ins ins insulated from the truth. 
I am a mother, so I don't know if I would be as strong as Emmett Till's mother was in 1955 when she wanted photos of her slain son to be published. But Mamie Till knew that horror had to be seen. We need to be shocked to be moved. I mentioned these latter examples today because although they each bring attention to Mamie Till Mobley's legacy, they also underscore her role as a grieving black mother whose response to her only child's cruel death ignited civil rights activism and situated her within the history of the civil rights movement. However, although her decision to open Till's casket is significant, what else do we know about her? What were her additional acts of engagement? How did she continue to pursue justice for her son and for others? And 68 years after Emmett Till's murder and 21 years after Till Mobley's death, how are people still adding to both of their legacies and the ongoing fight for racial justice? These are some of the questions that I ask in my work on Mamie Till Mobley. While Emmett Till's death was a major influence on who Mamie Till Mobley would become and the work that she would do, it did not solely define who she was. When Mamie Till Mobley died from kidney failure on January 6, 2003, at the age of 81, almost 50 years after her son's death, segments of her life and work were remembered fondly in numerous obituaries, and she was honored in national periodicals such as the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times. While the recognition of Till Mobley's life and work is commendable, we must consider how she is largely represented and remembered. The words, her pain united a nation, are inscribed on Till Mobley's gravestone at Burr Oak Cemetery, the Alsip, Illinois burial ground where Emmett Till is also interred. And although an obituary published five days after Till Mobley's death in the Washington Post mentions her time speaking publicly about her son and his death, it also claims that many black leaders felt her greatest role came at the height of her pain, the decision to have an open coffin. So in this lecture today, my goal is to expand our knowledge on Mamie Till Mobley and portray her as not just a woman who painfully grieved the barbaric death of her son, but as a devoted social change agent who was influenced by a robust African-American rhetorical tra tradition, a tradition that includes how black writers, thinkers, interlocutors, and activists deliberately use communicative acts and texts to influence others to move act, believe, and promote causes for survival and freedom. Although Tim Mobley is widely credited for her open casket decision, and in many ways inspiring a new generation of civil rights activists, we often leave her in this moment and neglect to understand the scope of her work and its impact. I expand how we see Mamie Tim Mobley in my larger book project, and over the course of six main chapters, I detail the importance of labeling Till Mobley as one a preparer. As I explain how Till Mobley taught her son about navigating the ways of the Jim Crow South, Richard Wright referred to this concept as the ethics of living Jim Crow. And today, iterations of this tradition live on in what is commonly referred to as the talk that parents have with black adolescents to educate them about racism and policing. Till Mobley was also an orchestrator as she arranged how her son's corpse was presented to different audiences from the images of him in his Sunday best that she pinned to Till's casket to illustrate the violent ways that white supremacy violated black bodies and disrupted black life, to the images printed in the black press that circulated across the country. We must also see Till Mobley as three, an orator, and four, an educator, due to her belief that Till's story should always be told and taught. Given her inter interest in subjects like English, and poetry, and her experiences as a public teacher, playwright on the South, and, a, and playwright on the South Side of Chicago, Mamie Till Mobley believed that knowledge creation is a transformative practice. Because she did not confine herself to the classroom, Till Mobley was also a political lobbyist. She was a fighter for racial justice and was committed to holding state powers accountable for the roles that played in the death of her son. This image here shows 
uh, Mamie Till Mobley canvassing on the U.S. Capitol uh, a month or so after Emmett Till is killed. And next, we must see Mamie Till Mobley as a foremother. A few years prior to her death, Till Mobley was asked about her legacy and the role that she played in making the world a better place. Some things are better, Till Mobley remarked. But what happened to my boy still happens, honey. Don't forget that, she told the interviewer. Over the last decade or so, the Black Lives Matter movement has centered the deaths of black youth and adults, from Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, to Tyree Nichols and Breonna Taylor, to challenge many of the dominant narratives that circulate about why these people were killed. Just as Till Mobley wanted us to see her son as a human being first, not a victim, a martyr, or a racial stereotype, we see similar acts from black mothers today seeking to protect their children's legacies via the complete and truthful stories that they share about them and the ways that they keep their children's memories alive via political, educal, educational, and community activism and organizing. For the remainder of my time today, <clears throat> I'd like to share with you snippets of Till Mobley as an orchestrator, orator, and educator. When we think of the details of the Emmett Till case, what perspectives or vantage points get amplified the most? In other words, what stories do we choose to circulate about this story? Public knowledge of the case usually unfolds in this way. On August 28, 1955, about a week into his summer visit to the Mississippi Delta, Emmett Till, a 14-year-old black teenager from Chicago, was kidnapped at gunpoint from his great uncle's home and murdered by a group of white men led by half-brothers Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam. As a black male, Till allegedly had committed one of the South's most egregious offenses, flirting with, assaulting, and whistling at a white woman. As punishment for his alleged crimes, Till was beaten, pistol whipped, and shot in the head. His nude and mutilated body was found in the Tallahatchie River on August 31st. Barbed wire connected his neck to a kind gin fan that weighed in the range of 75 pounds. Once Till's body was discovered in the Tallahatchie River, his mother mandated that his corpse be returned to Chicago for burial a decision that countered the state of Mississippi's plans to bury Till immediately and without wide range media coverage. When Till's body arrived in Chicago, Till Mobley insisted that she identify her son and decided to hold an open casket funeral and subsequent memorial services, again ignoring the wishes of the state of Mississippi. I've got a job to do, she said, when others tried to prevent her from seeing and revealing her son's body. She deliberately chose to present, to present people with an opportunity to bear witness to an act of brutal and racialized violence in the American South. Mamie Tilmoli received the news that her son was missing around 9.30 a.m. on the morning of August 28th, approximately seven hours after he was kidnapped from his bed at his great uncle's home. Almost immediately, she assembled a network of people to assist her with ha handling this devastating situation, including union organizers, the black press, and the NAACP. When Till Mobley was finally informed that Till had been killed and that her Mississippi relatives were preparing to memorialize him in the Mississippi Delta and leave his body there permanently, she firmly said no. I wouldn't want him buried in Mississippi under any circumstances, she asserted. She then orchestrated a series of steps to ensure that her son would be laid to rest on her terms. Two of these steps including call, included calling A.A. Rayner, one, one of Chicago's most prominent funeral directors, and asking him to prepare Emmett Till's body for not only burial, but public viewing. When Rayner failed to dissuade Till Mobley from her decision, he ultimately asked if he should try to make Till appear more presentable before being exhibited. No, let the world see what I've seen, Mamie Till said. 
Rayner worked on Till's face anyway, and Till Mobley commended him for what must have been a challenging and mentally draining task for him. Rayner had to remove Till's tongue and his dangling eye, and he closed his mouth and eyelid, which means that the images of Till that ultimately haunted people all over the world were not as horrific as the actual body that Till Mobley examined at the funeral parlor. As many as 5,000 people saw Till's body the first night that it was made available to the public on Friday, September 2nd, 1955. More than 40,000 people viewed Till's body the next day, the day that Chicagoans attended his funeral at Robert's Temple Church of God in Christ. Loudspeakers were set up outside the church so that the 10,000 individuals waiting in line across eight or more blocks could hear the service. And Till's burial was postponed from Saturday until Tuesday to give more people the opportunity to see his body, which was available from 6 a.m. to 12 a.m. on these extended days. Hundreds of thousands of people walked past Emmett Till's casket over a four-day period. Black parents brought their children with them so that they could bear witness to the atrocity. Till's Chicago friends served as pallbearers, and nurses were posted near his casket to help individuals who could not contain their composure after they saw the state of Till's body. One out of every five people who viewed Till's corpse had to be assisted due to fainting. And as this article uh, says here, all were shocked, some horrified and appalled. Many prayed, scores fainted, and practically all men, women, and children wept. As Mamie Till Mobley put it, people had to face my son and realize just how twisted, how distorted, how terrifying race hatred could be. How I had menaced my son during his last tortured hours on earth. How it continued to stalk us all which is why people also had to face themselves. They would have to see their own responsibility in pushing for an end to this evil. After Till's funeral, many individuals throughout the United States felt emboldened to blame all of Mississippi for Till's death and directed their anger towards the state. Mamie Till Mobley asserted that her son's killing was a habitual act of racial oppression and violence in the southern states and proclaimed that the state was going to be held accountable for her son's death. Someone is going to pay for this. The entire state of Mississippi is going to pay for this. He didn't do anything to deserve this, Till Mobley vowed, before stating that Till's death was an illustration of an everyday occurrence in Mississippi and that navigating the state was like walking into a den of snakes. Perhaps the most scathing response of all came from NAACP Executive Secretary Roy Wilkins. Wilkins accused Mississippi officials of fostering an environment of racial inferiority for African-Americans in the state and argued that Till's killers felt entitled in the state to maintain white supremacy by murdering children. The killers of the boy felt free to lynch him because there is in the entire state no restraining influence of decency, not in the state capitol, among the daily newspapers, the clergy, nor any segment of the so-called better citizens, Wilkins declared. When it was time for Till Mobley to attend the murder trial for her son's accused murderers in Sumner, Mississippi, she resided with Dr. T.R.M. Howard, a wealthy physician, gifted orator, and the founder of the Regional Council of Negro Leadership, a premier civil rights organization mostly active in the Mississippi Delta. There will be hell to pay in Mississippi Decent citizens are not going to continue to be treated like this, Dr. Howard announced after learning about Till's murder. As seen in this publication, in which Dr. Howard wrote the foreword, Mississippi was framed as a ticking time bomb and epitomized the savagery that characterized the U.S. South. And I'll just add, when Emmett Till was killed in August of, uh, in August of 1955, he was just the latest of a string of murders that were happening in Mississippi that summer. An NAACP leader was killed in May in the States, and two weeks before Till was killed, another man was killed on the courthouse lawn of a Mississippi town for trying to register people to vote. So people saw Emmett Till as just 
the latest incident happening uh, in the state. Born in Murray, Kentucky in 1908, Dr. Howard was called the most controversial figure in Mississippi. And he lived at a well-secured compound in the all-black town Mound Bayou, which was about an hour drive from Sumner. When the black press and other activists traveled to the Mississippi Delta to cover the trial, they most likely stayed in Mound Bayou. Many of them stayed at Dr. Howard's almost 200 acres estate, and those who traveled with him, including Till Mobley, were transported in a bulletproof vehicle. Dr. Howard was arguably the first Mississippi contact that influenced Till Mobley's thinking and desire to become a more involved social justice advocate. She respected his community building work in Mount Bayou, which included establishing a public zoo and swimming pool for local black residents. And in her words, it was fascinating to learn about Dr. Howard, a man who could have rested comfortably with his fortune and never worried about a thing. But he didn't seem comfortable at all resting with his own while there was so much deprivation around him. He didn't seem like a man who could just sit back and refuse to get involved. He was committed to making things better. In working and staying with Dr. Howard, Tim Mobley was introduced to an entire political network of Mississippi civil rights activists. She met the Mississippi Field Secretary, Megger Evers, who Howard had mentored and previously employed as an insurance agent. Till Mobley valued Evers' perspectives on grassroots organizing and Mississippi's place in the national fight for racial equality. And she was moved by how her son's death motivated Evers to work tirelessly for civil rights legislation, risking his own life to do so. Another NAACP leader that Till Mobley revered was the Southeastern Regional Secretary, Ruby Hurley. In similar fashion to Evers' position, Hurley believed that the South was not just a place of racial violence, but of black empowerment and social and economic revolution. Until Mobley's words, Hurley was intense. She was intelligent and she was never intimidated, as tough and as forceful a woman as I have ever met. She seemed fearless to me, never hesitating to move forward in any situation where she might be needed. And oh, that woman could hold her own in a room full of men, all the while never forgetting that she was a woman. I liked her and I was proud to know her. Although Tim Mobley was in Mississippi only because her son was brutally killed, she was in good activist company during her short time in the Magnolia State. In addition to Evers and Hurley, she worked with other celebrated Mississippi uh, organizers, such as Amzie Moore, who once claimed that the work of the black press made Emmett Till's death the best advertised lynching. Given Mississippi's dangerous socio-political climate for African Americans, Till Mobley considered these on the ground activists and journalists to be national heroes for their resilience and commitment to securing racial equality. By the time she traveled back to Chicago, Till Mobley had witnessed a strong tradi tradition of black activism and organizing in Mississippi, a tradition that intersected with her son's death after she orchestrated the unveiling of his corpse to the world. While Chicago provided Till Mobley with a political network to make her gesture to circulate images of her son's corpse, corpse possible, Mississippi instilled in her a durable activist framework to sustain her socio-political engagement going forward. Till Mobley's time in the South with Mississippi activists and black journalists was clearly a defining moment for her developing interest in social justice work. The political organizing that Till Mobley witnessed in Mississippi also helps us reconsider notions of black resistance in the U.S. South. Although dominant narratives of the Great Migration recognize the reasons that black Americans escaped the South, it is important for us to not forget the black Americans who stayed and continue to resist segregation and racial terror there. Mamie Till Mobley and her relationship with black activists and members of the black press are responsible for the images that haunted a generation of young people and motivated them to protest racial injustices and social inequities. 
When young black people saw Emmett Till's image, which was photographed by Jet Magazine's David Jackson, they were sickened to realize that even youthful innocence could not protect black people from succumbing to racialized violence. As cultural historian Maurice Berger has argued, the civil rights movement occurred during the rise of television, mass photojournalism, and other technological advances that made information more accessible and capitalized on the power of visual images to edify, edify, convince, and persuade. As the civil rights movement progressed into the 1960s and young activists entered the freedom struggle by joining the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC, and other civil rights organizations. Many of them disclosed that the images of Emmett Till's murder, because of Mamie Till Mobley's orchestration, fueled their desire to become activists. According to Simeon Booker, the first black reporter for the Washington Post, and one of the black Chicago reporters covering the Till case in Mississippi, Mamie's decision had rallied the black people in Mississippi. According to Mississippi native, former SNCC activist and sociologist Joyce Latner, she was a part of the Emmett Till generation. No other single incident had a more profound impact on so many people who came into SNCC. We had seen the Jet Magazine cover of Emmett Till's disfigured and bloated face with one eye missing. It was just an awful picture. In the 1980s, I asked Mrs. Mobley, why did you have him buried like that with an open casket? She told me I wanted the world to see what they did to my baby. We were his age and could identify with him. I felt that if they had killed a 14 year old, they could also kill me or my brothers. We knew that men were lynched, but we had never known of a child being lynched before. On a profound personal level, this reality had a strong galvanizing effect on all of us. The image is with me still. It became etched in my generation's consciousness. Fannie Lou Hamer was another Mississippi native and SNCC activist who was empowered by Till's murder. Years after Till was killed, she discussed its connection to her trajectory as a civil rights activist in Mississippi. In speeches, in speeches throughout the 1960s and into the 70s, Hamer noted how as a resident of Ruleville, Mississippi, a place in the Mississippi Delta, she often referred to as the ruralest of the ruralest and the poorest of the poorest in the United States of America. She was harassed by the brother of J.W. Milam, a local police officer who like his brother had done the night of Emmett Till's kidnapping, had shown up to her home during the early hours in 1963 with a flashlight and a gun to harass and, and intimidate Hamer and her family because they were registering to vote. While Hamer never hesitated to discuss the legitimate fears that black people had and how they were treated as second class citizens in the Mississippi Delta, including expressing her own experiences with police brutality, sexual assault and medical racism, she also wasn't afraid to speak truth to power and challenge the status quo. As she states in this 1968 speech delivered in Kentucky, we have a grave problem that's facing us today in this country. And if we're going to make democracy a reality, we better start working now. Because I cannot stand when people stand to sing the national anthem. Oh say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail? I ask myself the question, what do we have to hail? when actually the land of the free and the home of the brave means the land of the tree and the home of the grave in Mississippi. By listening to these accounts and noticing these details, we understand not only Mississippi's racial past, but the voices and deeds that resisted and fought back to create a more just state, region, and country. Historian Robin D.G. Kelly sums up the Emmett Till generation in this way. The Emmett Till case was a spark for a new generation to commit their lives to social change. They said, we're not going to die like this. Instead, we're going to live and transform the South so people won't have to die like this. And if anything, if any event of the 1950s inspired young people to be committed to that kind of change, it was the lynching of Emmett Till. 
After seeing Till's corpse, the young activists of the Emmett Till generation decided that enough was enough because they understood that if they did not fight for societal change, they could be the victims of violence too. Mamie Till Moley's orchestration introduced young black people to a level of racial hatred that many did not know black children were susceptible to. Till Mobley's subsequent act to her casket decision included participating on a national tour with the NAACP to educate more audiences about the lynching of her son. By partnering with the longstanding civil rights group, Till Mobley combined the death of her son with the political work of the black organization's larger fight for racial equality. She also began the next phase of her life, which comprised of becoming a public figure, a public figure speaker, and educator. Mere months after the violent killing of her only child, Mamie Timoli realized that she wanted to spend the upcoming years of her life teaching small and large audiences, audiences alike about the life and death of Emmett Till. On the various stops of the tour, Till Mobley educated audiences about who her son was, how she mothered him, and how his story was part of a larger narrative about race, violence, and justice in the United States. For instance, during a mass meeting at Bethel AME Church in Baltimore in October of 1955, Till Mobley told a crowd of 3,000 people that she was not there to stir up race hatred but rather to prove that race hatred is a thing we can't afford to have. If we can't step out race hatred, there will be more Emmett Lewis Tills, she stated. Till Mobley also asserted, as long as conditions exist as they do, I'm going to fight until my last breath and ask the audience to invest in $5 for freedom because I have invested a son. The audience hung on to every word, according to the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper. And the newspaper reported that audiences' applauses interrupted Till Mobley 15 times. While maybe Till Mobley's time with the NAACP provided her with a powerful platform to reach mass audiences, the circumstances of the tour were not always ideal. On one occasion in between speaking stops, Till Mobley was hospitalized in Chicago and treated for nervous fatigue, and police were called to guard her room due to threats on her life. And after Roy Wilkins removed her from the speaking tour in November 1955, due to disputes about money and payments, Till Mobley's character was attacked in the press, and she was almost hospitalized again. In her words, I have financial worries. I've been ripping and running and I am still in a numb state. The loss of my son has left me that way. I'm ready for a hospital. In a letter to Wilkins to hopefully resolve the matter, Tim Mobley wrote, the objective of the NAACP is of much greater concern to me than my pocketbook. I set out to trade the blood of my child for the betterment of my race and I do not now wish to deviate from such course. I feel very bad that the opportunity to talk for the association would be taken from me. Please let me go forward for the NAACP. It is a duty. I would not want it said that I did anything to shirk it. By participating on the NAACP circuit, Mamie Till Moley began her career as a public pedagogue an identity marker that she possessed for the rest of her life. And when she finally found herself inside a classroom, the teaching mission that she started with the NAACP continued. In the introduction of her memoir, Tim Mobley underscores her pedagogical purpose. She writes, I didn't see right away, but there was an important mission for me to shape so many other young minds as a teacher, a messenger, an active church member. God told me I took away one child but I will give you thousands. He has, and I have been grateful for that blessing. Despite starting her college career in 1956 at Chicago Teachers College, 16 years after her high school graduation, Till Mobley was a confident student. She started a study group with some of her classmates so that, so that she could learn from their diverse viewpoints. 
She joined the college yearbook staff as a layout editor, and she was initiated into Kappa Delta Phi, the International Honor Society in Education. After Till Mobley graduated cum laude from Chicago Teachers College in January of 1960, she began her teaching career at Carter Elementary School on Chicago's South Side. According to journalist Cynthia Dagno Myron, who was a student of Till Mobley when she was a fifth grader, Mamie Till Mobley lost a son to hatred, but inspired hundreds of children to strive for excellence. In fact, she demanded that we do so. She taught us we could do anything. She taught us to be proud of ourselves, to love our blackness, perilous as our lives would be because of it. I went on to become all the things I had dreamt, largely because of that remarkable woman. She invited me to dream as big as I wanted, to do all the things she had hoped her son might do someday. Working primarily with black inner city children and in special education programs, Till Mobley encouraged her students to reject a vision of themselves that did not lead to academic and professional successes. Emmett lost his life, but his mother saved ours, Diagonal Myron asserts. When Mamie Till Mobley retired from the Chicago public school system in 1983, after over 20 years of teaching, she began working closely with the oratorical group, the Emmett Till Players, and its umbrella nonprofit organization, the Emmett Till Foundation which presented academic scholarships to college-bound students and provided children with lessons on civic engagement and academic achievement. On the eighth anniversary of Emmett Till's murder, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, undoubtedly his most celebrated oration. Dr. King also spoke about Emmett Till on several occasions, both before and after his 1963 speech. A month after Till was killed, Dr. King told his congregation at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery that Till's lynching might be considered one of the most brutal and inhumane crimes of the 20th century. And he questioned how Christian jurors could exonerate the two white men charged with killing Till. During a 1958 address, at Greater Bethel AME Church in Miami, Florida, Dr. King reasoned that Till was a mere boy who was used as a victim to terrorize Negro, Negro citizens and keep them from the voting polls. And as seen here at a 1966 rally at Chicago Soldier Field, Dr. King declared that a system of oppression was responsible for the violent deaths of the four girls attending Sunday school at 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham and the lynching of Emmett Till and assassination of Megger Evers in Mississippi. Although Till Mobley never met Dr. King, she actively followed his career and respected his work. After Dr. King's assassination on April 4th, 1968, Till Mobley wanted to do something to keep alive his messages of love, peace, and justice. When Till Mobley's principal at Carter Elementary tasked her with planning and executing the school's black history program in 1973, the same year that Till Mobley earned a master's degree in administration and supervision from Loyola University, she realized how she could honor Dr. King's life and work. Taking into consideration what she learned in her college English and speech courses, her passion for education, and her admiration for Dr. King's masterful sermons and speeches, Till Mobley established a program that focused on delivering Dr. King's orations. The same year that the state of Illinois became the first state to make Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday a state holiday. Merging her pedagogical concerns with her son's legacy, Till Mobley called the students that participated in her program the Emmett Till Players. The construction of the Emmett Till Players was very calculated. What first started as a school assembly program turned into a regular drama group that consisted of children from both Till Mobley's school and young people from her local church. Where Till Mobley was a founding member, church secretary, and Sunday school teacher. On the rhetorical work of, Emmett Till, of the Emmett Till players, Till Mobley notes, more than just the words they would memorize, I wanted them to know the meaning of the words, 
the message behind them. More still, I wanted them to have the attributes they would need to excel in anything they chose to do. Confidence, discipline, industry. They have developed those attributes that carry them on to success in so many fields. And they have learned their history, that so many sacrifices were made for the opportunities they enjoy. That's why I named the group in honor of my son. I learned that our progress as a people will come in two steps. The first was to make sure our rights were secured, that opportunities were created. The second part was my part and the part so many of us can play to make sure young black kids were ready to take advantage of the opportunities that were created. With the Emmett Till players, Till Mobley implemented culturally relevant pedagogical practices that connected academic lessons to the personal lives, experiences, and aspirations of the players. As Till Mobley told Jet Magazine in 1984, my dream is to instill a sense of black history in the children and open up Emmett Till centers across the country that offer music, drama, any of the arts. I have big visions. In helping young African-Americans strengthen their public speaking skills, the Emmett Till players emphasized and implemented the rhetorical canons of memory and delivery. Often transported in a conversion van that was driven by Till Mobley's husband, Gene Mobley, the Emmett Till players traveled across state lines to deliver Dr. King's speeches at churches and other community venues. Players were responsible for memorizing and delivering between six and 20 snippets of Dr. King's orations at any given scheduled performance. Many of these performances are on YouTube, so please check them out. The work of the players perhaps came full circle when the group traveled to Denver, Colorado in 1976 for the unveiling ceremony of a statue that depicted a bond between Dr. King and Emmett Till. I was overwhelmed by the tribute. This was the first official recognition that Emmett had not died in vain, that something had been gained by my tragic loss, that there was a link between Emmett's death and the push for change, Till Mobley said about this occasion. While the spreading of Dr. King's speeches remained a central component of the Emmett Till players, Till Mobley's vision for the group was much deeper than that. Although Till Mobley arranged frequent rehearsals for the players to practice their lines, these occasions also allowed group members to bond with each other and with Till Mobley. It was not rare for Till Mobley to gather the players whose ages ranged between seven and 12 around her kitchen table to discuss their school assignments, plans to pursue higher education, and strategies for how to navigate America as black adolescents. No matter if she were teaching in the classroom or directing the Emmett Till players, one thing is clear. Mamie Till Mobley relied on tenets of rhetoric to create, articulate, and execute her pedagogical work. As we move forward, we must remember that Till Mobley believed educating others about racism and racial justice could be an appropriate way to atone for her son's death and guarantee that he, had, he would never be forgotten. Legislation that is currently being created and passed to ban critical race theory, black history, and DEI programs is against everything Mamie Till Mobley fought for as an educator which was teaching black students about their history, even its darkest moments, which included the death of her son. People have told me to let this thing die, even people in my own family, but people need to be aware to Mobley disclose to the Associated Press a month before her death. Till Mobley's life did not end after Emma Till tragically died. While the narrative of the grieving and suffering mother often dominates how she is remembered, it is important for us to know who she was after the tragedy and what she did with her life after her son's death. Thank you. Well, I do believe we have time for questions if there are any. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if you... Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
it, it, it's official. Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering if you came across anything um, in terms of Mamie Till Mobley's reflection on, uh, over the course of her life, the, the circulation of the, the narratives and images and, and that practitioner sort of reflection on, on what that looked like in terms of how she learned through practice um, and watching things unfold. Yeah, so I think the important thing is to know that her memoir was not published until after her death. Um, and so she was actively thinking about it and, and, and with Christopher Benson, who was her co-author for it, they were trying to piece you know, her thoughts about this event 40 years or so after it happened. But I think for her, she was still kind of weighing with it for all of these years, which is why it took her so long to actually come to terms with writing the memoir. And so with that being said, I think that this still was a heavy issue for her to kind of contend with, you know, that her son was not only barbarically killed, but there was also no form of legal justice. And she also didn't get any apology from the state of Mississippi from the leaders and the officials there. An apology did come in 2008, but you know, she passed away in 2003. And so I think there was a, a lot of anger that she still had, although she was doing very important and meaningful work in her local community. And you know, one of the things that I didn't specify in the presentation today is that she was also monitoring other racialized events where mothers were losing their children. Um, so she was also very clear in understanding that this tragedy happened to my son and it could very well happen to other people. And so she still wanted to you know, do some type of work in that regard. But in terms of, of ever coming to terms with um, the weight of Emmett Till's murder and what that image, image uh, did for you know, activists and people in this country, I'm not sure if it, if it really hit her that way because she was still kind of grieving, you know, for 40, 40 years after, after the death. Thank you so much. Dr. Irby, thank you for that wonderful talk. You. Um, you began the talk by reflecting on the different ways that she has been surfacing in popular culture and different representations on the f big screen and on the television. Yeah. And um, I'm thinking about the ways and, and the way that she's been evoked in our country's reckoning with these horrific events that continue to happen. In keeping with her legacy as a teacher, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, or if you've encountered, how she appears in curricula, the way that people teach either black history or American history, and thinking about you know, this extended legacy she has as, as someone who was working beyond, you know, quote unquote, just the, the woman who made this very powerful decision to yeah. showcase her son. Yeah, so I think, we are, we're living in this, this moment, as I said earlier, of you know, remembering her in, in very rich ways. I think prior to uh, you know, the last few years, she was only seen in curricula as the, the woman who opened up the casket. And I think now we are starting to see that she was doing some, some other things, uh, great things that you know, shouldn't be you know, taught uh, by historians, but also should be taught to children in classrooms. And I also think that there is a, uh, a role that the family, a prominent role that the family is now playing in this history. Um, mm -hmm. Many of the family members felt that the Emmett Till story was kind of taken away from them. Mm -hmm. And they weren't able to, you know, highlight what they believed were important attributes of Emmett Till's story in life and Mamie Till's story in life. And now we are starting to see more of their their contributions into this story. And so the, the family has created a, a Emmett Till, a Mamie Till Mobley Institute, where they are now creating programs, educational programs, curricula, that will then be um, you know, circulated to uh, schools 
hmm. so that children will actually see from the perspective of the family hmm. what are the most important things to highlight of this story. And I think one of the, the things that is important for uh, the family today is that we teach the full story of Emmett Till's life, mm-hmm. because so often we see him as a dead, you know, 14 year old. And he had a very rich life prior to that moment. And in some of these um, programs that we're seeing now, Women of the Movement and Till, they're very strategic in highlighting that, mm. that he wasn't just this, this person who was slain in Mississippi, but he had friends, he had a loving mother, he had a loving family, he liked to play baseball, he had all of these, these interests. And so really just to show a rich and fuller picture of, of these people, I think, is where we're going uh, with the two of their, of their legacies. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Irvy. That's great. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the secondary trauma associated with researching this kind of material yeah. um, and, and diving into the archives like you have to. Absolutely. Well, you know, the, I presented on the, the Uvalde shooting, uh, and that one really weighed with me um, because obviously we are currently in this moment of seeing these, these mass shootings. But then when people say, oh, but Mamie Till, right? So there's never a disconnect for me uh, in thinking about the history and also the present. So that also weighs with me uh, quite a bit. But I will say that what I want to make sure we do is be able to separate these things. And so what I wanted to do today is provide you all with the ways that Mamie Till kind of gets you know, push back into the spotlight when these different issues come up. But what we often see on social media is that there is a conflation of the, the context with the two. And, you know, Baby Till Moly wasn't just opening up her casket for, for people to see. She actually had to prove that that was her son <laughs> because people in Mississippi were saying, oh, that, that could be any, any person. That's not your son. That's any any person that you find in the river. And so the reason that she did what she was doing is different from what people are saying we need to do today with these instances of of mass shootings. Right. We're talking about a lady who was operating in this moment in 1955. How many more bodies do we need to see you know, to know that these things happen? Right. And so I I'm kind of weighing with that. But I also see that there are differences. And for me, that's what kind of saves it a little bit, um, that we can speak to um, the relevance of her work and her gesture. But we can also think about what we can do in our own moment to kind of think of our social political issues today. And so with that, I can, you know, distance myself away from, you know, the, the, the mental state of studying a horrible uh, event such as mm-hmm. this, this, um, this murder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's Lectures in History podcast. To find even more history content, visit c-span.org slash ahtv.